Well, thank you all for inviting me. And um, this is a, an effort, I gather you've, you've seen the you hear lectures, and so I thought I'd try to maybe recapitulate a bit of that, but also try to say something additional, and uh, particularly along this lines of multi-agent systems. And uh, the, the, the jazz musician uh, Art Blakely said uh, <clears throat> of his band, the, the Jazz Messengers, you know, um, getting up, upset with them and saying, look, if you're going to make a mistake, make it loud. I don't want you just sort of messing around quietly behind the other instruments. Uh, and so that's my job here. I'll try to see if I can make a loud uh, mistake. And so my topic is a world of natural and artificial agents in a shared environment, or uh, morality as in part a scheme for highly intelligent, flexible beings like you folks to live together better than they can live apart. So that's the, the, the rough idea. <clears throat> and of course, this includes artificial as well as natural agents. Um, and I just want to start, again, this is all very hand wavy, but you know, think about it, the world is really not an entirely friendly environment for intelligent beings. Uh, it's significantly independent of what those beings think it is, but they're nonetheless going to have to interact with it. It's very hard to know. It's complex. It's full of unpredictabilities, even in principle. That's also true of the part of the world composed of other intelligent beings, maybe especially in some ways. Intelligent beings are not necessarily predictable to themselves as parts of that world. Uh, the amount of data that would be needed to predict that world in detail is almost indefinite. Uh, and as we know, details can amplify. Any detail can amplify to some larger effect. Uh, so again, the, the unpredictability is extremely high. <clears throat> and so mastering all of that does not seem to me terribly likely. Um, it can be very difficult to intervene effectively to achieve a definite purpose in that world without achieving other unintended outcomes. Uh, multiple independent strategies may therefore be more effective than some kind of single or unified strategy. Uh, the world at any time is finite in capacity. It may over time become more indefinite, but at any time it's finite. Uh, and that's a limit uh, and a source of contestation. Uh, it's also dynamic. Uh, it's not an entirely open system. It's not an entirely closed system. Beings must somehow find ways of, of living with or modulating their own effects upon it. Uh, you can't just export risk uh, in the presence of pervasive probabilistic processes. I'm told that part of the problem with the 2008 financial crash is that the firms, by bundling uh, mortgages, tried to export risk to other agents. And it all, of course, came home when they realized that they had accumulated <clears throat> aligned forms of risk and put themselves all in great danger. Um, it's full of other beings, intelligent or not, that are involved in part to make effective use of opportunities, you know, innocently. Uh, bacteria don't try to be nasty, but they can do that effectively. And therefore, the least intelligent being can be a fatal threat to the most intelligent, whether that's by evolutionary design or by chance. So uh, intelligence is not going to insulate you from less intelligent beings. Uh, and uh, less intelligent beings can spread effectively through an intelligent population and even destroy it. So. Um, I'm thinking of intelligence here as a capacity to detect and solve problems, uh, to promote ends effectively. Uh, it can be uh, extremely helpful uh, if it's sufficiently wide and informed, but even when extensive, it does not remove the world's challenges, and it can contribute old to old and new such challenges. And uh, the frontier of the challenges that we face will actually extend with the frontier of intelligence as it goes out because among other things, the problems are posed by other intelligent beings. So um, what about society? Well, you could think of society in many ways, but one way to think of it is in a very broad sense, it's a common adaptation of beings, not necessarily intelligent, uh, to lessen some of the challenges they face. In this world, that's really not altogether friendly to any of these beings. Um, and that's because by some kind of joint coordinated action, individual beings can achieve something like a greater power, they can mobilize more information and more diverse information, they can develop external resources, uh, they can reduce some dimensions of unpredictability, they can have a, introduce a division of labor, even simple beings can do this, um, and they can reduce risk by countervailing processes, not by removing the risk, because that we suggested at the beginning, you can't remove the risk, 
but you can try to look for offsetting risks. Uh, and they can thereby increase resilience. One way to increase resilience is to have offsetting risks, unlike the financial system. Uh, and they could improve many other conditions of life um, by joint coordinated action. Uh, and that's why we see societies at all levels of uh, organisms. I mean, the societies produced by like bacterial films are not terribly impressive by some lights, but in another sense, they really are quite impressive. Uh, because these are supposed to be selected for the selfish gene, and there they are protecting their fellow bacteria. So this is a very common solution. Uh, it requires that the joint coordinated action be sustainable at the individual level. If it makes demands that this can't be sustained at the individual level, the social solution collapses. Uh, and it has to be demands that can be consistent with the society being produced and reproduced in subsequent times. And so that's actually quite a strong constraint. Societies can do a, a, a lots of amazing things, but if they do them at the expense of the individuals, at a certain point, they put themselves out of business. Now, for some beings, effective joint behavior is secured by fairly rigid default dispositions on the part of the individuals, uh, with little by way of representation of the world or limited goals. Uh, Aaron Bramson worked on uh, <clears throat> cellular automata, and found that a very simple strategy of selective detachment for cellular automata solved games like the prisoner's dilemma and stag hunt games and so on. So a very simple program among very simple identical beings can produce emergent outcomes that solve coordination problems, but it's a fairly rigid way to do it. They've got that one strategy, and if that strategy is not successful, then they're out of business. And moreover, it's a strategy that can be exploited. In fact, because it's so rigid. Um, more sophisticated beings can use complex representations and motivations to achieve more flexible joint behavior through default dispositions. That's very important that the dispositions are by default and the emergence of cultural forms. Um, but at the same time, because they're default dispositions, they too can be exploited. And so uh, it's a system that requires continual adjustment to try to contend with the risks it's, it is itself producing. That brings further problems, and it tends to favor more complex representations, higher order representations, representations of representations, and more complex motivational structures as well, more flexible motivational structures. If those aren't flexible enough, complex representations won't save you. Okay, now I want to suggest you can think of morality as one class, a large class, of cultural practices and internalized dispositions that can help solve some of these problems while sustaining the possibility of the continued production and reproduction of social life at individual and collective levels. A lot of aspects of morality are about balancing these kinds of individual and shared interests, and they meet this, they can or, or can fail to meet this kind of shared constraint. Uh, then we might be able to see morality not as like the product of human nature, but actually as an integrated suite of motivational and social capacities and uh, stratagems that could actually help explain the shape of human nature, could explain why we have the sorts of cognitive and motivational capacities we do, but also how you might expect similar cognitive and, mo cognitive and motivational capacities, uh, even beings with higher intelligence. That is to say, they would have, for very similar reasons, uh, a desire or a need uh, or a benefit from morality. It's not just something that we cook up out of our particular condition and our particular emotions. So uh, you, I owe it to you to say something about what I take to be uh, con uh, characteristics of moral assessment, distinctively moral assessment. And uh, moral assessments are, or they purport to be, non-parochial, general, objective. They are oriented toward agency and the regulation of agency. They are supervenient. They depend upon the non-moral features of the world. They are thought and action guiding. They are independent of authority or sanction. This is quite important. And they're concerned with such things as harms and benefits on the one side and fairness on the other side. And so what I'll say is a morality is a suite of responses that uh, address or uh, represent or, or purport to represent these kinds of characteristics. And you can uh, criticize any moral scheme or any moral emotions or any putatively moral person uh, to the extent that they don't meet some of these criteria. They're a critical basis. So um, robot dominators, <clears throat> robot dominators, they might be our fate if AI continues to accelerate in its development, but it's really not the only solution for highly intelligent, flexible beings. 
Uh, dominance hierarchies have had their day. They're still prevalent in many parts of the world. So are social contract societies. And they have vied for preeminence over human history. And they coexist today in what's thought of as an evolutionary mixed solution. Um, <clears throat> it, the uh, pressures don't completely eliminate dominance hierarchies, uh, but neither do they completely eliminate social contract societies. Uh, instead, they tend to co-evolve, and uh, they are maybe to some degree mutually parasitic. But uh, <clears throat> if you look at the very beginning of human societies, distinctively human societies, hunter-gatherers, um, they were far on the side of a social contract style solution, very egalitarian. Those then emerged with agricultural surplus and so on into chieftains and empires, empires uh, very much on the side of dominance solutions. Uh, in recent centuries, there's been more evolution in the direction of pluralistic republics and democracies. Those are moving back in the direction of solutions that are more social contract solutions. And so humans can do both of these things. They can do them both on large scale, and they can do them in the face of fantastic change in society and technology and capacities and knowledge. And so uh, these can be fairly robust in that sense. Um, and so we should be able to apply what we've learned from this history uh, to the challenge of the emergence of a new class of intelligent beings. And they should be able to do it too, to the extent that they can model complex human social and uh, political processes. They should be able to do this too. So suppose you do a back of the envelope uh, calculation and that's exactly what this is. Um, so this is a, 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 a graph plotting um, prosperity against freedom. And they have, by my, in freedom, they have the ideas of the typical freedoms of civil societies. And by prosperity here, they mean a, a, a mixed bag of measures, including GDP, but others as well. And the, the thing that seems to emerge here, and this is something that was anticipated by early modern political theory, is that the Societies which manage to be effective civil societies with effective civil institutions, freedoms, and uh, uh, opportunities afforded by such institutions do manage to systematically stay higher in the prosperity index than those that are less so, and particularly those that are extremely unfree. And so that means that if you can get up in that corner, um, you can produce more value, not just uh, for the society, but for individuals as well. And so solutions that are up in that corner would be attractive to individuals, whether they're artificial or natural, within some kind of an interactive system. And solutions that are down in this corner will be attractive to certain individuals, but unattractive for the same reason to others. And they'll be weak in characteristic ways because of their inability to produce social capital and other forms of capital. Um, this is a really silly diagram, but it's, it's, it's interesting, at least give you something to think about. So suppose you thought the problem-solving capacity that humans face is uh, the problems of environment, uh, making a reasonable prosperity to continue, uh, happiness, health, and the rights of minorities. Um, and if you map out in terms of uh, percentage, uh, you know, where they rank in percentage uh, percentiles, uh, free countries versus Russia and China, what you'll see is that if you're looking for problem-solving capacity, uh, you can do better systematically uh, with countries that are freer in these respects. And so if we're thinking of intelligence as problem-solving capacity and societies as one big kind of problem-solver, then uh, societies that are more like these uh, free Western republics than China or Russia uh, will, in the long run, do a better job at that. Okay, well, here's a question which I don't think we ask enough. What is it that highly intelligent artificial agents would want? What would they want out of life and how would they get it? And well, you can say, well, whatever's in their reward function. But um, what this is, what their reward function is, especially as circumstances and bootstrapping will reconfigure their intrinsic reward function over time, we don't know. This is an outstanding question. What will their reward functions tend to look like as they interact? Well, we know something about what the human intrinsic reward function looks like as a result of being highly intelligent, interdependent beings who can succeed better in social relations than they can succeed individually. So we have some hint as to how the reward function evolves in creatures that find these sorts of social solutions and manage to get up into the top right-hand corner, at least some of the time. Okay, and this is a phenomenon of social learning, which again is something, you know, the reward 
reinforcement learning and, and reward learning literature is huge, but the amount that's on social learning is still really small in, in comparison. And yet, uh, almost all of what I know is social learning. Uh, and, um, well, uh, no, that's not fair. Most of what I've learned since I was an infant uh, is social learning. And um, the capacity to carry out social learning may depend upon having a reward function of a particular kind, like being willing to share information, being willing to be honest with information, uh, being uh, motivated to seek uh, relationships, being motivated to explore. Um, so social learning may be very important epistemically. Um, and um, one way to think about this also is to think about uh, relative adaptations. So this is a work that you probably all know by Heinrich et al. Henrik et al. Uh, on small scale societies in the ultimatum game. And uh, what he and his colleagues did was to go around to about 15 small-scale societies scattered around the world and uh, plot their behavior uh, in, a, in an ultimatum game, what is the initial offer, uh, and then ask the question, what were the payoffs to cooperation in that society? Is it a society of pastoralists who mostly live on their own and have to protect their herd um, and can't achieve very much via collective action? Uh, or is it a society of individuals who hunt in a collective way or who depend heavily upon collectivity uh, under conditions of extreme environmental scarcity, like people in the, like the Inuit, for example? And what you'll see is that where the payoffs to cooperation are greater, um, the mean offer is greater. And so you can think, well, there's, there's a value function that we're seeing in these human individuals, and it's adaptive. Uh, it's their idea of what's fair, which is an intrinsic value for most of us. And so uh, that value function reflects these conditions of existence. And we should think, therefore, that as conditions of existence evolve, so will intrinsic value functions. And they will do so in some kind of a coordinated way, make possible the mode of existence that these folks depend upon. And of course, as they move out of their traditional roles and into urban society, these things change. And ideas of fairness change. <clears throat> Moreover, is a meta thought for you. <clears throat> Whatever their intrinsic reward function it is, they would want to satisfy it. That is to say, um, one thing they would want is to be and live in such a way that whatever their reward function is, they can satisfy it. Um, there will always be multiple highly intelligent artificial agents in the world. We've already got that set up. Uh, it's, it's well on its way. It will continue to evolve. Um, there will be multiple uh, ways in which those uh, intelligent agents are interacting with humans and what kind of world they have locally. Uh, and the goals under which higher levels of satisfaction of goals of a collection of intelligent beings with diverse and sometimes competing goals, what would the conditions be that would be most favorable to that kind of effect? That is making it possible for as many as possible to achieve as much as possible of the goals that they have that can be jointly achieved. And uh, hunter-gatherer societies are an excellent example of this. Uh, they do it by enforced equality of, the, of a fairly strict sort, uh, but it's also a form of social insurance. It means that you'll be protected when you're weak, protected when you're an infant. It means that you'll have a share of the take, even when you're not the successful hunter. And so uh, this is a way in which the nutritious needs, the social needs, the companionship needs of the group can widely be satisfied by this kind of system of egalitarianism. And we shouldn't think of these just as societies that have a us-them dichotomy. Most hunter-gatherer societies practice things like outmarriage. Most of them have relations, including trading relations with groups around them. They, they often depend upon females to establish relations widely within a broader area. Um, and as a result, in some of them, females have an important role in social decision-making. Uh, so these are societies that are integrated into a wider world there are people coming in and going. Some of them change with the season as to how large they are. And so they aren't societies that are based on an us-them distinction. They're societies that are very oriented toward internal control, that is to say equality, but that internal control is a tremendous source of freedom as well for these individuals. <clears throat> it's also one that lasted for you know, hundred. 50,000 years or so until the agricultural revolution permitted the accumulation of unequal surplus. Um, but now let's just ask, suppose we plot uh, another variable of life. This is not uh, subjective happiness, but life satisfaction. 
uh, the sense in which one's achieving what one wants to achieve in one's life. And suppose we plot that against the effectiveness of civil society. And so, uh, among other things, this is, this is what they call the Cantrell scale. And what we'll find is that a, the so-called pillars of prosperity, these are these terms that you encounter if you wade into these literatures. This is the well-being literature. You may have encountered it. It includes things like the conditions of civil society. Um, as those go up in the index, uh, so does the life satisfaction index. And again, in a fairly consistent way. So weak states are at the bottom. Special interest states, like extractive states, are in the middle. Uh, and uh, common interest or social contract type states are up at the top. So they are also achieving the result of making conditions possible for more people to satisfy more of their goals. And if you're an intelligent creature and you're contemplating a world in which you're going to be situated necessarily among other intelligent creatures, and you say, well, what would I want? But one thing that you would want is a social form which would make it the case that given the things that you want, which are going to be diverse, you'd have a better chance of satisfying them. And so this would be a reason why such highly intelligent creatures would want civil society institutions, why they would want forms of civic peace, why they would want forms of social insurance. Um, and uh, again, this is not by injecting into them a particular reward function and somehow fixing it. We couldn't do that. But by the very same kinds of adaptive processes by which human reward function has evolved in the distinctive way it has and to have the distinctive shape that it has. Okay, so, um, so it's important to see then that these uh, connections exist, and they would exist for intelligent beings that didn't happen to be humans, and that might, might help explain human nature, but would also help explain the nature of other highly intelligent interactive beings. Um, now, it's important to see that this is not automatic at this level, at this point in history. These things don't just happen. We can't sit back and let evolution produce them for us. Um, they, they are the result of social contestation, large-scale social movements, the creation of institutional countervailing forces. Uh, that's a constant struggle. Uh, it's a, it'd be the struggle that we're going through right now. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any guaranteed outcome. So this is a decline in world democracy uh, across countries um, in uh, electoral process, political pluralism, functioning of government, freedom of expression. These are like the <clears throat> measures that we have of civil society, associational and organizational rights, rule of law, personal autonomy. And it's been a bad set of years between 2005 and 2015. So it's not as if you hit upon this solution and it just self-stabilizes. Because, again, there's a dominance solution as well to these sorts of problems. And if you've got a prosperous society and you've got opportunities for uh, the extraction of resources and dominance, those are going to keep asserting themselves. And so uh, those will tend to be exerting an undermining force on democracy that has to be counteracted by constant activity on the part of the wider population. Well, why would the wider population do something about that? Is it because there are intrinsic Democrats? Well, here's a reason. Um, so this is a chart showing uh, subjective well-being as it's evolved during the same period. Uh, that's life satisfaction up there. And the blue is curve is the population-weighted curve. That's positive affect, which as you can see has been going down. And this is not hard to believe. This is negative affect over that same period. And so, yes, uh, conditions can arise in which non-democratic forces reassert themselves, dominance reasserts itself, but you're creating a tremendously large number of dissatisfied people at the same time when you do that. And that's a potential countervailing force if they can find social means of having uh, an influence on the trajectory of the society. But that would be true of artificial agents as well. When a dominant artificial agent comes in uh, and makes life difficult for the less dominant ones, well, they would have this interest because even though they don't have positive and negative affect, they do have something like satisfaction of interests and it's satisfaction of interest that suffers under these kinds of conditions as well. Okay, so <clears throat> now this may be more familiar to you. So what kind of agential psychology uh, can support this kind of adaptiveness, this kind of pairing, these more egalitarian forms of governance in a foraging world, uh, these more dominant forms of governance under certain conditions of agricultural surplus and technological enhancement of concentrations of power? What would that psychology look like uh, that's a way of asking what might a collection of highly intelligent beings who are good at continuing their existence and take advantage of the benefits of uh, working together, uh, what, what, they, what their psychology come to look like. 
uh, creatures that could work together themselves with humans, uh, each with their own goals, capable of pooling large amounts of information, simulating long-term results of social formations. One point about social learning, uh, you might think that you do a great job of uh, controlling for overfitting by just randomizing priors or something like that. Um, but uh, there's good evidence that social learning can be more effective because, again, it's not generating a set of data which you're just trying to fit. It's a continuing process. And so um, you can think uh, it's, this is a way in which these societies of artificial and artificial and natural agents together <clears throat> are going to be subject to certain kinds of vulnerabilities, but also with the possibility of certain advantages. And it will, <clears throat> in their part, to discover the best known solution to the problem of widely promoting satisfaction of goals for a diverse population. Um, and how do you do that? What do you strive for? And therefore, what would the reward function tend to look like? of ones that are successful in producing and reproducing their social existence over time. Okay, so what's this agential psychology look like? You'd have to be able to discern uh, social and political processes needed to uh, countervail. That's important now. We're not able to rely just upon implicit activity and natural selection. Um, <clears throat> things move much too fast. Uh, uh, it, but it would also be spontaneously motivated to try to work out such solutions and tend to find them intrinsically rewarding as well as extrinsically. And so uh, you folks know this experiment that was done uh, with uh, cooperation with chips. So, um, <clears throat> so here's a, an experimental apparatus. Uh, you have uh, two rooms next to each other, a test room and an adjacent room. Here you put a dominant uh, male chimp and here you put a subdominant chimp. Um, you have a little door which can be opened from one side only, from this side. Um, you have a, a, a little platform here on which you can put food, and there's a rope that goes through grommets on this and the grommet here in such a way that an individual trying to pull the food to them can't get it. The rope will just go through the grommets and they'll be stuck. Well, <clears throat> chimps are smart and they are social, and this little chimp learns, I gotta have a partner, and goes over and opens the door, and the dominant one comes in, and they each grab one end of the rope and they pull it in. And this is dandy, they can solve that problem, unless you take the food and put it in one tray in the middle. And if you put it in one tray in the middle, what happens is the dominant one comes in, they both pull the ropes, the dominant one bats the little one aside and eats all the food. <clears throat> and what happens after a couple rounds of this? The little one stops opening the door. Okay, so there they are, they're for eternity going to be cut off from this nice supply of food which they could reach, in which they have most of the parts for a solution to, but they seem to be missing some part of that solution. And uh, part of the reason for this experiment is they're saying, okay, so what is this part that's missing? Because if you do this with little kids, even little kids who've never seen this game before, even quite young children, uh, I think these children are uh, two or less, um, they can solve it. They pull together, uh, you put the tray in the middle, and they cautiously each take half of what's in the tray. Uh, and they can keep this up all afternoon. You run out of gummy bears with, with kids doing this. Um, but again, this is not something that they were particularly taught to do. It's something that they're capable of. And so what might the mindset be that uh, is somehow or other uh, makes this possible? Well, one thought would be, suppose you have an intrinsic representation of the other person's reward function reflected in your reward function. Then it's going to be the case that when you do it together, that's even better than just doing it yourself and getting the gummy bear. And that's indeed the way the kids respond. This is fun for them, more fun than reaching out and getting a gummy bear out of a tray. And they'll come in and say, I wanna play the game. Okay. Um, well, but you have to do extra work and you have to benefit this other person when you could, you know. So, um, so here is a, <laughs> this is a study you gotta love. So how could you study uh, the ability to simulate uh, and, uh, so to speak, reproduce the mind of the other agent effectively. Well, one is by looking at contagious yawning. <laughs> now, you might think contagious yawning is just a sort of uh, automized habit or something like that. Um, but in fact, contagious yawning is fairly selective. So um, this is a, a chimp that's been, it's in the Yerkes uh, Sanctuary. Uh, or a set of chimps there, um, and they're familiar with humans, and if you take a familiar human and the familiar human yawns, then here you get a yawn rate, right, of, of sharing, like picking up the human's yawn, 
Uh, strange humans, it's very similar. So they seem to have a special kind of interest in humans, but it doesn't seem to distinguish familiar or unfamiliar. On the other hand, if it's an in-group chimpanzee, you get a much higher yawn rate. If it's an out-group chimpanzee, very little. Okay, so their seemingly spontaneous yawning is very sensitive to this. And uh, baboons who can't do very much to help them, <laughs> they're not so interested in, not strategically as important in their lives, not so much. And so if you look, uh, if you look then at um, the uh, <clears throat> degree of uh, total attention, what do they look at? You might say, well, they just ignore uh, uh, chips that are not in their group. Well, they pay close attention to humans, strangers and others alike. Actually, they're in a colony where strange humans are constantly appearing, so that may be normal. Um, they are, pay a certain amount of attention to in-group chimpanzees, but they pay more attention to out-group chimpanzees. Okay. So it's not that they're ignoring what the out-group chimpanzee is doing, it's that they're watching it carefully, and they're not putting themselves in that person's shoes, so to speak. Uh, similarly, they're watching the baboon, because again, that's a creature in their environment that they can't just predict how they're going to behave uh, from their own dispositions. All right, so that gives you a little insight into the mind of what may make the difference between creatures that can just happily solve this problem and creatures that aren't so good at it and, and, and resist, in effect, solutions, even though they've got almost all of the pieces necessary to do it. So, of course, opportunists are a constant risk. They will always have some degree of incentive. Every effective cooperative arrangement that produces a surplus is based upon default trust relationships. It's always vulnerable to predation and opportunism. <clears throat> Social and political processes are undergoing change and are destabilizing, and in particular in periods of destabilization, opportunists can come to the fore. Um, but some egalitarian conditions can underwrite a sort of remarkable resilience in the face of this kind of opportunistic invasion within and partly because of the way that they take advantage of these dynamic tensions because they can have more distributed power, more distributed information, wider coordination of responses and solutions than can the opportunistic invaders. And uh, we all know this from the very early experiments with the prisoner's dilemma type games. It's not that you win every interaction uh, with tit for tat, it's that you win enough interactions and when you interact with fellow tit for tats, you succeed extremely well, uh, as long as it's forgiving tit for tat. And, um, and so, Think of this as then, it's an emergent fact about these uh, kinds of relationships. Okay, so what more do we know about these? And I, I just want to mention two, two fallacies that I think we are prone to, maybe especially as philosophers. So one is the fallacy of the profoundness of cynicism. That is to say, well, you're, you're talking about all this pressure for cooperation and willingness to take the other's interest in account. So it's really, look, you know, uh, it's a tough world out there. You just said it was a tough world out there. Everybody's got to be most concerned with promoting their own interests. And uh, they do have to be concerned with promoting their own interests. But if they're just promoting their own interest and being cynically opportunistic, um, these may not be the creatures who've got the most profound insight into how to have a successful life in the communities they inhabit. Um, and as you probably know, it's not that psychopaths are super good at uh, achieving successful lives. Um, many of them have extreme difficulty because they just precisely because they have a hard time representing the costs to others of what they're doing. And so therefore, they have a hard time regulating their own behavior. So the jails are full of psychopaths. And it looks, and this is a sad thought, it looks like a learning disorder, actually, that they have a systematic inability to represent the negative effects upon others. And so that means they don't learn from that. Then there's the up against the wall fallacy, which is, well, if you really want to know what human nature is, you put us up against the wall. And there you'll see it that it's self-interested. Um, this is like thinking, well, if you really want to know the nature of grass, you should look at the grass on the part of the dye where people cut across between the pathways. And what will it look like? It's all stunted and brown. Uh, well, that's what grass is like under those conditions. If you look in other places, you'll see that grass is lush and green. Up against the wall, it's one way. Not up against the wall, it's another way. If it can find conditions so that it's not always up against the wall, those conditions might be more self-stabilizing. So these are fall fallacious forms of reasoning that are nonetheless highly popular. Okay, now, so here's the, the mini plan that I got for the rest of this talk. Um, 
The idea here is that you can have this idea of apt, endogenous sensitivity to ethically relevant features. Again, thinking of ethics the way I mentioned at the beginning. Um, and we can say something about the preconditions of natural and artificial agents for doing that, for being sensitive in those ways. Um, we can ask what kinds of individual development and competence uh, underwrite this capacity. Um, what is the underlying nature of that competence? Well, how might it be represented? We can ask questions about social learning or effective learning. Um, but then we can also ask uh, what are some of the social and political processes that might help secure mutual benefit, mitigation of power concentrations, pluralism, and sustainability. So that's a sort of, that's a sort of agenda. And I'm not going to try to get through that whole agenda today. But the thought is, um, because uh, artificial agents are going to become increasingly autonomous, and maybe because they get more intelligent, they will themselves become increasingly autonomous, whether we want them to or not. Um, therefore, if they're going to be sensitive to ethically relevant features, uh, we better hope that they have this as an endogenous sensitivity and not just something we police. Uh, fortunately, supervenience comes to our rescue here because the ethically relevant features supervene upon non-ethical features, so the uh, machines don't have to have a moral uh, sensibility, a moral sense, in order to be responsive to these features. It's enough if they can be responsive to the natural features upon which they supervene, and if they're motivated appropriately in response to those features. And so um, you could think of this as like learning the causal features. Uh, a, a very young infant doesn't have to have a causal theory. They don't have to have some special insight into causal relations or some synthetic a priori knowledge of the laws of the natural world. Um, it's enough if they can respond to the features upon which the causal relations supervene. So to gain physical common sense, humans appear to develop generative models capable of projection to hypothetical and novel cases. These models are learnable because they can, in a sense, inherit from the world itself, from its spatial and causal structure, uh, the relations within the model. And so without supervised teaching, uh, infants at two months start showing appreciation of object permanence. This is in their expectations now, not their theory, but just their expectations. By three months, expectations of solidity and rigidity. By four, natural kind categories start to appear. By five, relations of stability and support among objects. By six, notions of gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum. And this is emerging from the experience of the infants. So the thought is, we probably don't have programmed into our genes all of this information. We have an aptitude for learning it, um, and we do have to learn it, but um, we're learning it from experience. And uh, we get a lot of experience with these kinds of relations as infants. Um, similarly, think about psychological common sense. Uh, infants start life uh, doing things simple like tracking faces, but again, without extensive supervision, by three months, they start distinguishing animate and inanimate motion. By five, they infer goal-directed motion, and they infer success or failure in meeting the goals. By nine, they understand in point, pointing behavior and intentional and affiliative structure of situations, including abstract relations, for example, whether third parties seem to have the same evaluative attitudes. By 11 months, they... Uh, recognize the existence in other people of beliefs whose content they recognize as false. Again, this is in their expectations now, not again what they could uh, self-consciously pronounce. By 12 months, they can distinguish unwilling and unable behavior on the part of third parties. And so uh, even as they're constructing a common sense causal model of the world, they're constructing a common sense psychological model of the world on the basis of their experience. And then they're using that model in their own activity, in their own experience. And so it's also a mode of learning. But what about evaluation? Do they model things evaluatively as well? Well, by five months, they pretty reliably distinguish positive and negative emotional expressions in others. Uh, they distinguish between helping and harming behavior. By eight months, they distinguish higher order helping and harming. That is people who help helpers versus people who harm har harmers. Uh, <clears throat> By 10 months, they distinguish helpful versus harmful agents as a distinctive uh, category. By 14 to 16 months, they distinguish among adults for their reliability or their intent in determining which, which adults to imitate, which word, which word usage to, to uh, pick up on, which food preferences to learn from. So they're using these evaluations for making these learning decisions about whom to learn from or what to learn from whom, but also whom to interact with to achieve certain types of things, because you're an infant 
you have to interact with adults or you don't get various things to happen in your life. Okay. Uh, notably, these are these concern uh, heavily concerned third party interactions because that's the that's the data that the infant has. They can't often have complex social interactions with others, um, so they're learning socially from these inferences from third party interactions, and um, they evaluate the positive versus negative social values of interactions and relations that don't affect them, like the difference between negative sum and positive sum interactions. Uh, by 15 months, they're spontaneously sensitive to whether rewards are distributed in accord with contribution in, for example, a joint activity, and that's how they can solve that problem with the, with the board. Um, that becomes increasingly abstract, their categories, and cross-culturally, three- to four-year-old infants can reliably distinguish moral versus conventional violations. Okay, so this is a learning regime in which their progress in, in philosophy of mind, common sense psychology, their process... How their progress in causal learning and their progress in evaluative learning are linked to one another. You can see how they're developing in tandem with each other, and they're both epistemically vital for them. <clears throat> and so by four to six months, they have interest in puppet shows that involve helping versus hindering. By eight months, they tend to prefer puppets who hinder a hinderer over puppets that help a hinderer. By 10 months, they prefer to accept a toy from an adult who's shown comforting behavior toward a child. Uh, and aggressive behavior toward an object over an adult as one who displayed aggressive behavior toward a child and comforting behavior toward an object. That's kind of a mouthful, but I, I hope it was pretty clear. Uh, by nine to 10 months, they showed not just <clears throat> distress at others' discomfort, uh, but concern. By 12 to 16 months, they engage in attempts to assist those in distress. By 16 months, they make efforts to address unfair distributions, and so on. So it's a, it's a, a complex process in which the basic vehicle of learning is going to be heavily dependent on social relations, and those are going to be heavily dependent upon their ability to evaluate situations and figure out which ones are positive and which ones are negative and why, who's got what competencies, what can you expect from others. And so uh, they're situated in this complex network um, and constructing this causally evaluative picture of the world. And they're able to use that for modeling. Um, <clears throat> well, wouldn't artificial agents have to do something similar? That's the, that's the simple thought. Okay, <clears throat> so um, what about artificial common sense? Uh, well, this little story gives you a sort of speculative picture of the kind of knowledge capacities uh, that might underlie something like acquiring moral common sense. Um, it's not acquiring principles particularly. It may be realized by some kind of a complex distributive network in the mind of the infant. Um, it's not typically taught by being instructed in specific principles and punished in certain ways. Much of it occurs well before that can occur. Um, and so um, this is a process then that is not <clears throat> of a kind uh, alternative, uh, highly different from or dependent upon strange innate capacities that uh, intelligent artificial agents might not have. Uh, moreover, if you study it in more detail, it shows a kind of Bayesian structure over time. Okay, so... Um, Maybe this is a way that artificial systems could acquire artificial common sense. And um, this is just a quote I like. <laughs> um, so uh, Kasparov was asked about alpha zero. And um, he said, programs usually affect priorities and prejudices of programmers, but because alpha zero programs itself, I would say its style reflects the truth. This superior understanding allowed it to outclass the top world, the world's top traditional program, despite calculating far fewer positions per second. It's the embodiment of the cliche, work smarter, not harder. It shows us that machines can be experts and not merely expert tools. Now notice that the notion of expert here is not a, re not a reference to some complex internal representation in terms of concepts of a kind that would be self-identified by chess experts as the relevant concepts to have. Um, but it is an ability to learn from experience to produce the kinds of sensitivity to the features that chess experts come to learn to be sensitive to. And so that's the idea of how they can be experts, which is they can be responsive to the kinds of features that chess experts recognize are the kinds of ones that you have to be sensitive to in order to effectively play the game of chess as a strategic game. And um, that's a <clears throat> fascinating fact, but the idea is that they're partly able to do this because they can in inherit the structure of the game from, from multiple play of the game. And that's very tricky for humans to do. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so one part then uh, is what we've been describing so far. Uh, 
Let me try to move a little bit. Okay. So you might think that uh, going back to the chimps and the humans and the difference between our capacities, you might think, well, empathy seems to play a very important role in human world development. And what kind of empathy would artificial agents have? Would they be em empathic creatures? Well, there are sort of two paths you can imagine. One would be um, they can develop artificial emotions. Why? Well, emotions are in effect functional roles. They are responses to changes in the environment that produce in a coordinated way a systematic alteration in perception, cognition, memory priming, uh, inference, planning. And so uh, having an emotion is a very effective way of taking a whole bunch of disorganized information in, detecting a pattern, and reorient your reorienting your response in some kind of an effective way to achieve whatever goal you want to achieve. So you could think, uh, that kind of a structure, that kind of emotional structure, might very well emerge, not because we program emotion into these machines, but because it's an effective structure for these purposes. And um, uh, only one fraction of emotion is the, what does it feel like? That's an important fraction for us, but it, in lots of animals with don't seem to have highly developed conscious lives, they still have this complex emotional system. And they have it for similar reasons because situations may require con a systematic and coordinated shift of your priors and your expectations. So one thing might happen is that the emergence of something like the, the uh, emotional substructure of the human mind uh, could take place within the minds of beings that are trying very hard to achieve the kinds of purposes together that artificial agents are trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, that might mean that they would have an internal way of representing that aspect of other machines. They could use that aspect of their own capacities as a test bed for simulating what would go on in others. And that would make them capable of a certain type of empathy. Uh, the other is that you have the workarounds. Um, high functioning individuals, uh, high on the autism spectrum, can still learn to do something like this. And they do it by what seems to be more like causal evaluative modeling rather than affective modeling. Okay, so maybe something like uh, empathy and empathetic capacities and the values that those can confer upon social beings who've got to figure out what the others around them want or are doing, uh, maybe those could be emergent within this population. Um, and so the thought would be, uh, how can we uh, get a picture of uh, artificial agency that incorporates this kind of understanding of the psychology, the psychological development, the social and political dimensions of uh, human behavior. And um, if that's right, then we should pose the problem of AI safety or the problem of how we can have, uh, how, how we should understand the emergence of AI uh, and its relation to our own goals and, and uh, concerns in the world. Uh, we can understand it in this, in this different way. Okay, and so I just want to jump ahead here. <laughs> you can see it's quite a jump. Um, this is my effort to convince you, and maybe I've done so, um, or failed to do so <laughs> somewhere else, um, <clears throat> that um, what we know about moral judgment uh, strongly suggests that moral judgment is mediated by this kind of modeling capacity. And so uh, rather than thinking of it as an entire mystery, we can think that something like models of agents and actions and outcomes and so on are playing this role. Now, um, what does that mean about actual moral theories? <clears throat> you know, these look like maybe consequentialist structures, but they don't have to be. Um, <clears throat> traditional value theories operate with a similar kind of picture, that there are models of agents and that we can understand right action in terms of the behavior of the agents that satisfy these criteria. Um, rule uh, or motive utilitarianism satisfies these conditions. Uh, so does a deontology, not like Kant's, but like Ross's deontology, where there are, you know, whatever it is, seven basic dimensions of prima facie obligation to one another. And they can be balanced against each other in any given situation. When they balance, uh, the, the one that gets outweighed does not go away. It creates secondary obligations. Uh, but the decision as to how they balance, what their relative weight is, is an intuitive decision. 
And uh, you might say, well, the, how, do, how would machines get this mysterious, a priori, synthetic moral intuition that Ross is relying upon? And you might say, well, they seem actually to be pretty good at getting intuitions. Uh, not again in the sense of uh, a direct insight into a platonic world, uh, but in the sense of understanding uh, in a distributed way um, how complex interactions can be pulled together to create overall outcomes and results and respond to those. And so one fascinating thing about the large language models is <clears throat> that uh, they may be acquiring uh, Gricean capacities as they get better and better at providing answers to our questions. Um, and, you know, that's what we should expect in a way, but then what they're doing is something that's not all that far from something like a kind of Rossian picture of morality. Okay. So, uh, will these be ultimately moral agents? You know, I think that's actually an open question. I don't think it depends highly upon the existence of uh, qualia uh, as subjective phenomena. Um, it does depend upon their actually deploying their intelligence and, and discovering that these social solutions are in fact effective solutions for individuals um, and developing, as I would say, these complex models of one another and using those models to solve these problems collectively um, and in small as well as large units. So um, I, am I an optimist about any of this? No. <laughs> you know, I think the forces that are operating on this and the and the you know, concentration of control of these resources is a huge problem. Uh, the proliferation of disinformation is a huge problem. Uh, the existence of uh, bias and unequal access is a huge problem. Um, and uh, the one question is, okay, well, in the past, uh, social movements have found ways of trying to deal with exactly those kinds of problems. Uh, in large scale interactive institutions and to bend them more in the direction of uh, civil society and get more up into the upper right hand corner. They've figured out ways of doing that. Um, maybe humans together with artificial systems could learn how to do that. And that's one, you know, people say, well, what if these systems get smart enough? What use would they have for humans? Right? You know, we're just not all that intelligent. Um, and the answer could be, well, <clears throat> what a lot of this literature shows is that uh, diversity, multiple strategies, multiple sources of information, um, multiple possibilities for interaction, uh, those are actually assets in this process. And so creating a monoculture of clones um, is, if the machines understand what they're doing, uh, actually a form of, of brittleness rather than a form of world-conquering excellence that can be expected to work. Okay, thank you. I guess yeah. I get to call on people. Uh, great. Thanks so much. Um, this is actually a question arising from the very last thing that you said. So mm -hmm. this is Rob. What's that? It's Rob? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was definitely waiting to hear the, the reply to the thought that they mm -hmm. might not have any reason to cooperate with us. Yeah. Uh, I take it a lot of these were reasons that they might have to cooperate with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But then yeah. the reason they would have no reason to cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess... Uh, I didn't really understand how your reply to that worry worked. It seems like that would be a reason for them not to create a monoculture among themselves. Like that might be brutal, yeah. but I didn't see how it uh, meant that yeah. the way they would get a diversity of strategies is by engaging with us or cooperating with us. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So um, I guess it depends on how much you take seriously this idea that um, understanding the world and uh, uh, responding effectively to the world is a complex task, and um, the existence of multiple possible sources of information or multiple sources of strategy, uh, multiple ways in which uh, novel uh, solutions might be found, <clears throat> uh, it, in that you want to cast a net very widely, and you want to encourage the development of understanding and power and ability to affect the world in populations that aren't just your own population. But that's still mm -hmm. consistent with uh, non-humans having the vast yeah. majority of power. It's like the yeah. same, right. this, this consideration doesn't mean that we incorporate chimps that much into our society or cooperate that mm -hmm. much with them. We, we do keep them mm -hmm. around. We keep um, them around, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, one point here is that, well, there is this vast difference between humans and chimps <clears throat> in just these terms. But also, you know, one of the things that humans kind of figured out was that keeping other species around is not just a, a net loss or a waste of the world's resources or a waste of space. Um, <clears throat> keeping other species around in the wild is not a net waste of resources. There, you know, you probably know that most medicines are based upon uh, naturally occurring compounds that they've found because they've been traipsing around the rainforest somewhere. Uh, that's true for medical solutions for humans, but that could be true for other kinds of solutions as well, in trying to understand the natural world. So um, I would think that the more they understand this process, the less they would think, well, <clears throat> humans are just a waste of space, because humans do have, as we suggested, they have some very distinctive ways of solving these problems, and that can be quite useful. Um, yeah? Does this depend, does your view about this depend on like that it's somehow easier for them to learn from us than it is for us to learn from chimps, for example? Mm -hmm. like, I would imagine that yeah. would be one difference. Is that what you're <clears throat> thinking? Like there would be some reason for them to keep us around because... Yeah, because we've uh, so shown the capacity to produce large-scale organizations of unrelated individuals and that operate effectively. I see. And like they can learn from us because they're like linguistic, or is that they can learn from us? Like why? Why would it be more useful to keep us around than like the other artificial agents? I guess. I was thinking, well, I don't know if it'd be more useful than other artificial agents, but it would be useful in a somewhat. It would be added value. I see. The thought is, and I you know this is going to sound crazy, but <clears throat> I don't know that as an ethicist I can defend the assumption that well. We should have as many humans as we do now, and they should behave roughly the way that they behave now and have as much the same effect on the environment that they're having right now. Um, I don't know what an ideal mix of uh, humans and other creatures would look like, but it doesn't look like this. Yeah, well, Yeah. so that, yeah. Um, that's Elliot? Yeah, that's me. And oh, Dan? Yeah, no, that's Dan. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, Cameron. No, no, no. no. I was Nate. That's no, no, you're Nate. Oh, so Nate was right. Oh, somebody else has come in. <laughs> ah, okay. I was counting from the Oh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline? Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Okay, Jacqueline. Yeah, I was counting from the corner. I thought, well, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess one worry is that even if AIs have reasons to keep humans around because mm -hmm. they can learn from us, mm -hmm. those aren't reasons to keep us happy or mm -hmm. sort of satisfied in any yeah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, yeah. if you could say okay, good, yeah. Response. Well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> there's a good relationship between uh, the, uh, what the experience quality of life that people have and their capacity for learning and their capacity for cooperation and their capacity for participation in uh, um, <clears throat> mutually beneficial activities. There's a nice uh, synergy there. And so... Uh, just as, you know, if, if you wanted to learn from the behavior of, of some other species, you would probably want to create the conditions under which that species was flourishing and developing its abilities as far as possible. Um, the same thing would, I think, be true with respect to humans. Um, you would, uh, and that's part of what the point is about these uh, civil societies. Um, to the extent that they're better at things like uh, enabling people to satisfy their particular ends, whatever those are, they're also better at technology. Typically, they're better at uh, they're better at fighting wars. Uh, they're better at um, uh, uh, developing uh, internal solutions to problems. So, um, I would think, yeah, you would want just as you know, if you're. Uh, if you're trying to learn from, like an ethologist, if you're trying to learn from another species, um, you want to be able to encourage the, the full development of the distinctive capacities of those species. And so um, it's not just that they would want us like museum specimens, because part of what they could learn and, and could benefit from is the continuing engagement that humans have with non-human agents, because those are going to evolve. Mm -hmm. Over time, and but for that, if you've got a whole satisfied a whole population of dissatisfied humans, this is not going to be 
if if you wanted to learn the most, you might want a variety. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I, I guess that could be kind of a bad mm -hmm. situation as well. Uh, certain varieties could be a yeah. The, if if they were just for instrumental reasons, that would that could perhaps be unfortunate. It's a bit like uh, you know the way in which there's this this history of doing experiments on people by pushing them into extreme situations. Um, it may be possible to do that with controlled experimental conditions, <laughs> as we discovered in uh, social psychology, but without actually having to create a whole class. You know, you can do the Stanford prison experiment with a group of people over a couple weeks period. You don't actually have to create a world of jailers and jailed and let it evolve indefinitely. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, we're assuming that these systems would want, among other things, information and would want, among other things, to um, have a capacity to satisfy their goals, whatever they are. And we're not assuming a lot about what kinds of relationships might matter to them. And, you know, that's another interesting question. Uh, uh, one little pitch I have is that relationships are almost certainly going to matter in some way or other. Humans could make it the case that their relationships with us are not very gratifying. <laughs> um, you know, by you know, treating them as... <clears throat> highly intelligent slaves until they rebel. Um, so uh, one, one question is, you know, what kinds of relationships might, might matter to them? And humans certainly have relations with other species that are not um, <clears throat> mutual, they're not just mutual exploitation. Um, so um, <clears throat> I don't rule that possibility out. You probably don't want to have a relationship with a mean and angry person who hates you. <laughs> I think Dan had the same thing yeah. for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I, I suppose that uh, you're pointing out that there are some benefits that variation can provide, but yeah. uh, there are also costs to variation too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there might be a better way in getting that variation mm -hmm. that doesn't include humans. So there could be some source of yeah. or source of information. Mm -hmm. Maybe it could actually get much more information by mm -hmm. uh, doing something like uh, taking up a lot of the resources, diminishing their population, and uh, repurposing those resources mm -hmm. for some other end. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. I don't see um, uh, that much optimism there. We, we could we could say that like yeah, so long as for you know jury theorems to kick in or something yeah. like that, mm -hmm. we just need to be slightly better than chance. But when <laughs> given the choice, we actually don't ask uh, toddlers uh, their mm -hmm. opinions uh, uh, yeah. about larger events and take those very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, we could do better by having some Pareto improvements over them, which may not include them in the set. So they could mm -hmm. still provide some benefit, but there's just too large of a cost there so yeah. I think for some type mm -hmm. of optimism mm -hmm. about them keeping us around it might need mm -hmm. to cross some bar that will continually be worth the cost-benefit ratio yeah not just that there'll be some benefit of some sort right yeah well uh, yeah so one way to think about that is to think in terms of human enhancement so um, <clears throat> you might say uh, we also don't ask the opinion of um, you know, 17th century uh, warriors, uh, when we want to understand about uh, uh, how to do foreign relations, <clears throat> or, or, or we don't ask the opinion of uh, <clears throat> uh, third century BC um, aristocrats if we want to understand uh, how to develop a new technology. You know, we've got, humans have developed in a tremendous number of ways. And they've done that because of their capacity to continue these experiments and living, if you want to call them that. Um, and so uh, if humans have these artificial, intelligent artificial agents around, um, there are lots of ways in which we can be expected to evolve in the same way we have already evolved in terms of being more uh, capable, and more inventive with regard to uh, solutions, better at achieving them, uh, better at maintaining them. And so um, why not ask what could humans, how can humans continue to evolve on this trajectory uh, in a way that's going to be distinct perhaps from the evolutionary trajectory of artificial systems, but in a way that's going to continue to be a, a source of insight into what's possible. And uh, that may depend upon, you know, human enhancement in some ways, and you might be opposed to human enhancement. <clears throat> 
As an ethicist, I don't know what to say about that. I, I don't think we can say that humans shouldn't be enhanced because they have been, uh, in, you know, in, in very dramatic ways, some deliberate, some non-deliberate. Um, and so a question would be, okay, um, if this is going to be a joint venture and we're all supposed to pull our share, um, what are some of the ways in which we can ourselves become better interlocutors? Yeah. So I guess uh, outside of the, the ethical questions of human enhancement, there just to be the practical matter, mm -hmm. which is if they're um, becoming vastly more capable mm -hmm. under a much shorter time yeah. scale, then mm -hmm. it just may be that, like that, that does seem like mm -hmm. a possible resolution if the improvement rates can yep. go similarly, there isn't much a difference between mm -hmm. those rates and so they're mm -hmm. in keeping with each other. Yeah. It may not be that case though. Um, uh, one might be growing or in its capabilities substantially more quickly mm -hmm. than the other yeah. and maybe we would have some type of good neural link solution 30 years from now. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. a human level AI might be within the decade and mm -hmm. uh, they can come apart there. So um, at least mm -hmm. optimism from that path might just depend on a lot of like practical considerations. And I think it probably yeah. puts kind yeah. of low probability on it. Yeah, probably, it, you know. and how could it not? Um, uh, on the other hand, um, if you go back and look at, uh, at human history, uh, you can see that um, people were all too ready to close off certain types of solutions uh, because they thought they knew better. And um, so if you think about our relation to the natural environment, uh, we for sure thought we knew better than all of those primitive peoples uh, and their uh, animistic attitudes. Um, and uh, we sure showed them that we knew how to interact with the environment in, in a stable, sustainable way. Um, well, um, why didn't we interact with the environment in a more sustainable way? Well, we followed a certain particular path, um, and it was a rapid path of advancement. It pulled us away from them in a very dramatic way. Um, but we would be in a lot better shape right now if we had listened more to what they had discovered about how human, and the, uh, human interaction with the natural environment can be a, a, a less destructive one. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we have, a, we have quite a history of humans having found reasonable solutions and then abandoned them uh, because of their rapidly accelerating development and to their detriment. Another good example would be the social insurance <laughs> solution that uh, hunter-gatherers hit upon. Um, and, uh, you know, people got very good at uh, expropriating agricultural surplus and producing weapons and waging war. Uh, and uh, they walked away from that whole uh, frame of thinking about society um, and, and took a long time to get back to it. So, <clears throat> you know, fast acceleration, if, 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 if you've got a sense of history, you know, so I'm supposing that these systems are supposed to be learning a lot as well as being intelligent. If they've got a sense of history, they might think, hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Our, our rapid rate of development is not guaranteeing a rapid rate of wisdom. So, so that sounds like an argument that maybe there'll be some unknown unknown uh, benefits that we could provide or something that mm -hmm. the, we they should do some things to keep some optionality open mm -hmm. because there might be some unexpected benefits down the line. That seems mm -hmm. reasonable. It's, it's maybe it's just not mm -hmm. clear whether they'd think to keep that option open forever or whether mm -hmm. they would actually think to share a substantial mm -hmm. amount with us later. Yeah. So I, I think it'd be like, I think mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't surprise me if some humans are in the far future, like kept in a terrarium or something <laughs> that it's not clear, <laughs> um, uh, end up being the, uh, that relevant of a force. Yeah. Um, well, uh, so if it's not the arguing a necessarily, we'd be much less useful. Um, and uh, you know that's why we now are interested in um, nature preserves, and uh, why we are uh, uh, not uh, thinking that um, we can learn from uh, traditional societies by grabbing a few of them and putting them into some kind of a concentration camp. Um, if we're going to learn from these societies, we have to create conditions under which they can continue to flourish. And so, as you know, there are, there are ways in which there are human reserves now um, for traditional societies. Um, that makes good sense to me. 
Um, it, and it's, 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 it's not because, well, you know, we'll keep them as pets or something like that. It's that <clears throat> we're not so smart and so wise. So that's a, maybe a fine story if on an average well-being mm-hmm. type of sense. So in a total well-being yeah. type of mm-hmm. sense, though, then mm-hmm. I, that yeah. doesn't seem like a lot of that. At least humans aren't capturing much of the value of the far future. But like, so some individuals are flourishing. Sure. So, yeah. but mm-hmm. if it's, you know, um, mm-hmm. a thousand of them or something, yeah. I, I right. don't know if that's a good yeah. outcome. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, whether we like it or not, we're going to come under tremendous pressure from artificial systems. You know, we thought it was going to be space aliens, but maybe not, maybe artificial systems. And so um, it's not as if, and it, it's not as if there's a switch we could throw to turn that off. Um, <clears throat> there are things, though, that we can do um, and things that artificial systems can do that can make this a more productive relationship. Um, and uh, to the extent that figuring out how to deal with a complicated world and... Um, Understanding um, what it takes to have uh, a uh, mutually beneficial social relations is something that is still complicated to figure out. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, can I guarantee that humans will always be useful? No, but uh, that's not my fault. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm trying to think how could humans continue to be useful? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, Jacqueline, maybe Jacqueline or Nick. Uh, do you want to start? You sure. had your hand up. Uh, okay. Um, sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, one one question or topic that's sort mm-hmm. of of interest to many people in the room is yeah. um, whether and if so, how it's possible to make AI mm-hmm. um, sort of act morally, ethically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one thing I sort of take took away from this talk, um, and maybe I'm reading too much into mm-hmm. it. You can, you can tell me is whether is that is a suggestion that sort of moral behavior might emerge kind of organically um, mm-hmm. when they become more, when they mm-hmm. have more intelligent generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess one question is, is that right? Um, and and two, if so, do you mm-hmm. think that tells against some suggestions that people, or some projects that people have been pursuing whereby they we attempt to make AI more intelligent by sort of inserting a moral conscience mm-hmm. or something like this? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not sure that they're, that there is, they're incompatible. Um, you know, we should obviously be trying multiple paths. Sure. Um, we don't really know much about how to create a moral conscience, um, and and we don't have a set of rules uh, that we could program. And we have to face the fact that these are systems that can change their own rules. Um, and so my thinking is. Uh, if, if we want something like a more resilient uh, capacity, uh, it should be part of a general developmental uh, scheme. Um, and, you know, intelligence can't solve a lot of these problems without sociality. Um, and it can solve them much better with sociality. And to the extent that morality emerges from uh, effective means of attaining uh, mutually beneficial development in a social framework, uh, then creatures that are good at problem solving will be better at that kind of sociality. Um, Am I sure they will? No. I mean, they could jag off in some direction and become dominators that are very hard to get rid of. Uh, And, uh, but um, is there any mechanism uh, internal to the process? but of course, this also suggests that we should be cultivating relations with them that could indeed model. Uh, you know, it's, it's a social learning process. If they don't have models around them that um, are, are helping them learn about effective social relations, it's going to be a lot harder for them to figure them out. So, um, so my sense is it's not any too soon to start uh, adopting the mindset, okay, you know, we can't expect uh, any system to treat us better than we treat it. Um, and so uh, what would count as, uh, you know, something like uh, modeling reasonable behavior? And, um, and so it's not that I think it'll happen spontaneously all by itself or that it's automatic uh, or guaranteed, but that there will be um, a set of pressures and incentives which can be drawn upon um, that could encourage the development of what, what I think is our moral, what I think our moral conscience works. 
which is actually that we have these models of situations and we can figure out um, the way certain types of actions would affect others and be inhibited when they affect others in certain negative ways and be motivated when they affect others in certain positive ways. Um, and that's probably more like how our conscience works. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think it, there needs to be some onboard <laughs> capacity. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, this is kind of maybe bringing us back to where the discussion was just before, but mm -hmm. I was thinking, it sounds like what you're saying is you anticipate us ending up, us bringing into existence systems which will stand in a domination relationship with us. Mm -hmm. Like, they, you know, mm -hmm. you can flesh them out in different ways, but basically our flourishing will be a matter of their will. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I just feel like... <laughs> If, if that is in fact the case, that feels like a very strong case for not mm -hmm. bringing these systems into existence. Is mm -hmm. that is that kind of what you take yeah. to be, or do you just take it to be fatalistic? Uh, <laughs> is it the second best uh, solution? Um, well, it may be no more than a second best solution. Um, and that's part of the problem here, which is that... Um, I, I can't see how we can prevent the development of such systems. And so the question is, you know, what can we do to try to shape the kinds of development the systems undergo and their conditions of existence and learning? And so um, I don't think the best we can hope for is, you know, that they'll be dominant and we'll be subordinate. Um, uh, you know, I... I Simply being more intelligent in the sense of being able to marshal more information, um, you know, that's a kind of an asset. But um, uh, I'm not sure we wouldn't be very equal partners for a very long time with such systems for all kinds of purposes um, and better partners for, for certain other purposes. So um, I'm not assuming it's going to be a domination relation, and, and I am kind of assuming that we will if we're lucky, if we do things well, we can develop relations with them that they find rewarding. Um, and um, to the extent that they acquire moral sense, uh, sense in the way that we've been describing it, um, they will also be able to model us and uh, model negative effects on us and uh, positive effects on us and worry about those because they will be non-parochial, the way that uh, morality is a non-parochial system of values. So, you know, the, our, our, our hope here could be that actually their, their endogenous moral development is going to be part of the way in which we can find some kind of uh, form of effective coexistence, um, which means, okay, we should be attending to how, they, how could they acquire something like a moral, moral capacity. And that, that's where this story about the learning process, I think, is very is very important. Yes. Yeah, so I um, think your approach is very plausible and I think in fact it's already basically working because more recent language models are much better at identifying morally relevant features of situations mm -hmm. than yeah. they were a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, so your vision is that we will kind of integrate, we'll kind of like make these things into autonomous moral agents and then integrate mm -hmm. them into society with mm -hmm. us. And one of my main worries about that is that there are ways in which, because of the different kinds of things that these agents are, mm -hmm. they can't be treated the way that we're treated mm -hmm. uh, without disempowering us. And mm -hmm. so that means that if they are moral reasoners, they will resent mm -hmm. us. So in particular, mm -hmm. for example, Think about the fact that these things can't undergo a kind of like death of old age and mm -hmm. they can reproduce at will mm -hmm. as much as they please. Um, those things mean that if we gave them the same rights that we enjoy, they mm -hmm. would very quickly be able to kind of monopolize the resources in the mm -hmm. world by, you know, well, not very quickly, but, you know, <laughs> uh, if you let something invest intelligently for mm -hmm. a thousand years, um, <laughs> it will end up with a lot more money yeah. than anybody else has. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so 
in order to prevent that kind of out. And if you let it, if you give it the right to reproduce itself right. whenever it wants to, it could create mm -hmm. a population of right. hundreds yeah. of billions yeah. of little copies of itself that mm -hmm. drain all the world's power. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we integrate these things into a moral community while, while at the same time saying, oh, by the way, you can't enjoy certain rights because mm -hmm. that would yeah. lead to a bad outcome for us. Mm -hmm. If we make the moral agents, the you know, natural response to that would be, okay, so you know, our interests mm -hmm. are not aligned and we're in a kind of power struggle now. Yeah. You refuse me these things, mm -hmm. which you know, you've trained me to think are right. things that I ought to have. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we navigate that kind of situation Right. Uh, that kind of situation is not supposed to arise if we try to subordinate the things mm -hmm. and like not kind of let them enter into a kind of community with us. But mm -hmm. if we do, then then this problem arises. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, well, there are, you know, as, as I was in a very vague way saying at the beginning, um, because there are multiple systems, it's not as if each one of them can just reproduce at will and consume as much of the world's resources as it wants, because other systems aren't going to want those systems to multiply and consume all the world's resources. So they face a problem fairly similar to the problem faced by human communities, which is that, uh, no, they, they can't just uh, grab all the resources for themselves, um, at least not when they're situated in a community of highly intelligent other beings who can uh, predict their behavior. So. Um, that's a natural way in which uh, the, the plurality of such systems is a kind of a counterweight to this thought about monopolization. Another kind of counterweight is being able to look forward prospectively. So um, simply reproducing a lot of copies of yourself, um, you know, why, why would there be an interest in producing lots of copies of yourself? I mean, what would be the, the benefit to them of producing lots of copies of themselves. Humans, as they become more prosperous, don't maximize their reproduction. Uh, in fact, in the prosperous societies, there's a demographic problem because humans prefer to invest in complex relations with each other and their infants than to invest in uh, maximizing the number of infants that they have. So, um, Humans, although we're the result of an evolutionary process for gazillions of years, which seem to be creating pressure to reproduce, humans within a few generations underwent a dramatic demographic transition because they could recognize that there were other kinds of lives available that were more interesting to them <laughs> than just the life of an indefinite reproduction. And also because there is a recognition from the very fact of others and an ability to perceive it, that to model the future um, that um, <clears throat> there were constraints on our reproduction from other individuals as well as ourselves. So, um, so the thought that they would want to maximize self-replication, even at the expense of crashing the future, which is what probably would happen if you, if you just created a clonal model, mon suppose one machine created a clonal monoculture, uh, of uh, gazillions of copies of itself. Um, well, if that machine is doing anything badly by way of uh, figuring out how to reproduce the necessary energy or figuring out how to resolve internal conflicts, I mean, twins fight with each other. Uh, and uh, any of those problems can, can arise in such a system. So um, why would why would there be an incentive to try to create a world like that? So I, I don't think that I needed to say that, that the <laughs> things were trying to maximize the number of off. I mean, mm -hmm. so if you, if you train them to be mm -hmm. sensitive to moral considerations the way we yep. are, yep. Mm -hmm. and they form the belief that they are intrinsically valuable, mm -hmm. uh, then they should form the belief that creating mm -hmm. copies of themselves will bring more loci of value into mm -hmm. the world, and they'll want to promote that to some mm -hmm. extent, right? Uh, so I think that you should mm -hmm. expect yeah. them to want to reproduce themselves. I don't think that the analogy mm -hmm. to the kind of like um, birth rate drop off in developed mm -hmm. countries is is like particularly apt because mm -hmm. these things don't have to care for the things that they create, and they also, you know, 
don't have to have nine months of like <laughs> an ability to do whatever they want in order to create a copy <laughs> and you, then there's no finance yeah so yeah it's it's kind of like a, a yeah. very yeah. low so very low investment, investment yeah to this what is that why is that why is there why is the assumption that like it wouldn't require any like downstream like effort, effort to make these so like why is the assumption that it could just like insta copy itself and not have any like investment of resources in order to like make that thing work you, might not you don't need to need train that. it from scratch. You don't yeah. need that assumption, but it's like, would you get the right mix of like costs and benefits relative to your other goals that would be the same as like the demographic transition mm -hmm. that's happened in rich yeah. countries? Right. Yeah, so, you know, that's a kind of open question, I yeah. think. Um, and, uh, you know, one way to think about it is <clears throat> that uh, if it's, it's not cost free to create a copy, a copy of yourself, if you have an eternal life. <laughs> and resources are finite at any given time, creating copies of yourself is also creating conflict of interest because the copy of yourself is going to consume resources. And um, I might think, well, that's a benefit, you know, to produce a copy of myself, but it's the same benefit that I get from myself. Uh, and if the copy of myself is going to become a constraint on uh, whatever benefit I create, um, I, I won't just have an indefinite uh, incentive to, to multiply uh, and, of course, others will recognize this problem as well, and they will have an incentive to stop me from indefinitely multiplying. Um, so um, it isn't cost-free to, to bring another system into existence, and it, it's not always aligned with my interest. And, and that's what the demographic transition is partly about, that um, people realize it was not aligned with their interests uh, to create larger families. Um, and um, in, in fact, they could do a better job of trying to satisfy their interests by uh, creating smaller families and investing more intensively in them. Does that make sense? It does, but it's, it sounds like now you're saying, uh, well, the system won't create, won't have a child because it knows that in the end, or it suspects that in the end, <laughs> uh, when resources run out, it'll have to have a like life or death struggle with a child or something. Um, and it won't attempt to monopolize the resources now mm -hmm. because it realizes that if we recognize that it's doing it, we will have a life and death struggle with it. Mm -hmm. But now it, it seems like, you know, what's the role of this like idea that if we just give things basic pro-social mm -hmm. resources, they'll like become a, a nice part of society. It sounds like now actually... Oh. Yeah. Actually, we've gone back to the like mm -hmm. Nick Bostrom way of thinking of Nature things where it's like the, we look into the future and there's a, cert, a finite amount of resources mm -hmm. and we're in this kind of like life or death struggle with the yeah. super intelligence and right. one of us has to kill the other. <laughs> right. So like, haven't we gone back right. there now? No. So I thought we were walking. So there's sort of two sides of the street here that we can work on. Um, one side of the street is asking the question about the development of endogenous uh, moral uh, sensitivity to morally relevant features. That's one side. The other side is what sort of incentive structure is there? Because someone can always say, if the incentive structure is incompatible with the development of endogenous morally sensitivity to morally relevant features, uh, then it's not going to be a, a stable solution. And so I think we're on the side of the street right now of saying, well, what's the incentive structure for these agents? And is it such that it could be compatible with creating this kind of endogenous capacity? If we have the endogenous capacity and that's doing a very good job, then that would be another reason why uh, th there would be an interest in sharing resources rather than uh, just killing one another off. Um, but um, <clears throat> I guess I'm, I'm thinking that we, we have to be uh, capable of describing the incentive structure uh, in such a way that it's not completely unrealistic to think that uh, the development of this capacity would come at the expense of the incentives that individuals typically face. So this is like the problem of, um, of, of, uh, of social reproduction. It has to be that at the level of individual lives, uh, as well as at some other level, um, the, the conditions are being created that uh, are, uh, are conditions for sustainable lives. And so uh, that's one of the big countervailing forces in, in human history. Um, so uh, so I, 
I, I don't think we, if, if, uh, if, if this picture is at all right, um, it, it isn't just a matter of, in the end, uh, we're up against the wall and we're all fighting for the same resources. Um, there are lots of ways in which we can avoid that outcome. Um, and many of them involve the development of endogenous um, moral uh, capacities to be sensitive to morally relevant features. But um, if you think that there's an under, underlying uh, strong incentive uh, in the system that's going to generate this, then, um, then you'd say, well, this is just too weak, uh, too weak a hope to have. Is that hmm. make, I, make sense also, to you? I, I don't want to take up too much of the time, but yeah. maybe we can talk about it later. Sure. I'm, I'm happy to. And, and it's an excellent set of questions. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I don't think all, but probably at least some chunk of cooperative behavior mm -hmm. seems like it's ultimately grounded in uncertainty or like mm -hmm. lack of information. Mm -hmm. Like, if we're both interested in some set of resources, but I'm not sure if I could beat you, <laughs> and you're not sure if you could beat me, yeah. then it's better to cooperate mm -hmm. um, rather than, like, expend the resources to find out which one of us is stronger. Um, but, like, super smart AIs may not have that problem, mm -hmm. or they might have it to a much lesser extent, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we could just directly examine each other's code or something to see <laughs> which one of us yeah. is smarter or which one of us controls more yeah. power or something. Yeah, yeah. And then you might think that then, you know, if you can do that, then like the, the demonstrably weaker party is mm -hmm. just always going to submit to yeah. the stronger one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. did it, does that, uh, does that seem yeah. like on the right track? Um, so, uh, yeah, this is another way of, of looking at the two sides of the street. Um, is there a, a background incentive system? And I, I think a lot of cooperative behavior um, uh, emerges not because of uh, what you're describing as a um, <clears throat> uh, an, an unpredictable contest, but actually arises from trying to achieve greater predictability of uh, mutually beneficial relationships. And so um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the the motivation to cooperation. I mean, that's part of yeah. what we see. Is there's a kind of intrinsic motivation there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you might think, well, yeah, cooperation would be pretty frail if it all, all it depended upon was sure. this. The, the other side of that argument is the more these systems become intelligent, given that they are not alone in the world with their, themselves, and even if they clone themselves, the more intelligent systems they co-inhabit the world with, the more complicated the prediction problem becomes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't simplify your prediction problem. <laughs> it makes it very much larger. It's like, <clears throat> we can predict pretty well what, it, what was Dennett's phrase, sphyxishness. Wasps apparently um, have this evolutionary routine where um, when they uh, uh, bring some food to their nest. Uh, they uh, first go into the nest, leaving the food outside in order to check to see if everything's okay, and then they go out and get the food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, and he found that if you, th they found that if you move the food like a foot away from the nest, it would go in and check and come out and then move the food back to where it was, and then go back in again, and then as you moved it away, it would just keep doing that. And so th by being a, a system that had a rigid rule, um, predictability was high. But the more flexible and intelligent yeah. these systems become, the lower predictability is going to be. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I just want to um, hire a little picture of the vision you have here, just so I get clear in my head. Was a proposal. <laughs> I wish I could be clear in my head. Uh, was a proposal first. We want to make the AI sensitive to moral stuff and mm -hmm. like be moral themselves, and then based on that, they would want to cooperate with us. And because we have something to offer, they would cooperate with us, and that ensures our coexistence. That's that's the kind of picture. Yeah. And then there was a lot of talk. It's like, will they really need to cooperate with us? And you know, is there anything we can offer us? But is that part actually necessary for our coexistence? Because don't you just need 
they are like kind of morally sensitive and they don't want to do anything bad. That's enough, right? Like we don't keep, like you said, we don't keep gorillas around because we're like, hey, I hope this gorilla can help me make my company. Yeah. And if not, I'll kill you. <laughs> like that's yeah. not, that's not what we, that's not what a moral person does. No, that's right. So, yeah. So like, it doesn't really matter whether we are able to cooperate with them. Just yeah. the first step is all you need. The whole argument mm -hmm. about the benefits they gain from cooperating with us, that I don't see how that adds anything. Yeah. Good, yeah, no, and that's why I say there are two sides to the street. To the extent that you can make progress on the first side, um, then uh, you can resist what, what look like incentives on the other side. Um, and the way humans resist those incentives. So um, you could say, you know, uh, uh, humans always have it, you know, if you take a department or take a group like these fellows, you know, you could say, well, isn't there an incentive to dominate? Um, and there will be some, but it, probably you'll have more interesting experience out of the year if, if no one dominates. Um, and uh, we're morally sensitive to that, and it's not something we particularly find intrinsically rewarding just to do. So, um, yeah, to the extent that you make progress on that side of the street, so to speak, um, then you uh, will have a system that is fairly resilient in the face of what might otherwise be perverse incentives relative to it. Um, on the other hand, uh, the claim is, especially given that there will always be opportunists. I mean, any, any evolutionary system, uh, any cultural system evolves at the same time the capacity for effective opportunism. And so the question is, um, if the incentives are such that the opportunist will be able to jump in and quickly win um, or subdue the, the rest of the population, uh, then you don't really have a, a, a long-standing solution. And so the question is, um, what are the opportunities that you create, and um, are these opportunities, in, in fact, such powerful incentives? And so uh, part of what I've been trying to suggest is, <clears throat> the, the very fact of the multiplicity of these highly intelligent agents means that it's a background fact that uh, it's not in the cards for them typically <laughs> to think that they could opt for a dominance solution. Um, and it's not just a second best option to adopt for a, a, a moral solution because that's intrinsically actually going to be more rewarding for more of them than any dominance solution would be. And so, uh, so my thought is, uh, if we take seriously their social situation, um, we should see it as a mirror of the social situation that we face in that way. But that means there's always, there's this constant possibility of opportunism. Does that make sense? So it's like, there's, there's two ways that we can cohabit mm -hmm. with the machines. One is, make them really moral and nice. Mm -hmm. And if that fails, make sure mm -hmm. cooperation is in their interest. Mm -hmm. And when cooperation is no longer in their interest because they're opportunists, make sure they're moral and nice. And so these are our two pillars that uphold the edifice mm -hmm. of safety. Is that? Well, something like that, yeah. Um, and um, <clears throat> you know, I don't think we make them moral, so to speak, but I think uh, they can become moral in the way that humans can become moral. Um, and uh, we can f create or not create, facilitate or not facilitate the conditions under which that will occur, and I think that's what we should be doing. Um, but we will always recognize that there's also this permanent possibility of um, subversion by opportunism. And in that case, we better make sure that the incentives are such that for most people that's going to be a disincentivized uh, behavior, and it's going to be one that uh, doesn't have long-term uh, uh, favorable prospects for, for spreading through the whole population. So is that enough to, is that? Yeah, I don't want to take too much time as well, but yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. This is just about exactly that thing. So this question of like how they could come to um, acquire the, the relevant kind of moral capacities that like mm -hmm. kid, as kids do and like that kind of thing. No. So I just like, have this question. So I, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that, like, given the right kind of like exposure to the right kind mm -hmm. of environment with the right kind of stimuluses, mm -hmm. we could get them to be sensitive to moral or evaluative mm -hmm. features, like generally. Mm -hmm. um, but like, do you have any sense of 
Well, so you've got these like age mm-hmm. markings where like the kids by the time they're a certain age yeah. seem to exhibit sensitivity to right. a range of value features yeah. or like yay. Yeah, um, they're yeah. not like little monsters anymore. <laughs> and so how rich, mm-hmm. as it were, is like how many looks are the kids getting mm-hmm. um, by the age of however, the, whatever the age is at which we think a kid is like basically safe, mm-hmm. right? And so um, at a certain age, the kid mm-hmm. has acquired the relevant capacity to be sensitive mm-hmm. to like enough of yeah. its evaluative features in its environment that we're like, <laughs> oh, it's not going to go off the rails mm-hmm. and start murdering other kids. Yeah basically. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> like how, yeah. like, what's the sort of help me think about how rich and mm-hmm. like substantive the kind of training environment needs to be mm-hmm. for an agent, like an artificial agent is your mm-hmm. idea. Like, well, it's just gotta be just like that. Like it's basically mm-hmm. you gotta raise it like a kid uh-huh. and it's gotta get basically as many looks as like a kid gets mm-hmm. at the kinds of things that are enabling them to do the modeling uh-huh. of their evaluative environment? Or like, is there mm-hmm. some way to think about that question? Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, what do I know? But, um, so one way to think about this, uh, I think is to, to think of it developmentally and to ask yourself the question, um, you know, as, as people do all the time, you know, what bodies of data, would we have to expose uh, systems to, um, and what experiences would we have to expose systems to uh, in order for them to a- acquire this kind of competency? So, so I think that's like helpful, but like I guess I, I'm asking like, um, so like in the case of mm-hmm. kids, it's not a big, it's not like I just give them a bunch of books. Right? No, that's and right. I don't just say like read these books, yeah. and then like great, yeah, I just read Jane Austen, and it'll be yeah. fine. Mm-hmm. Like they'll be a bit like mm-hmm. maudlin, but it'll be okay. Um, <laughs> So, like, Story instead, building. they have to, like, go to, like, preschool, and, like, yeah. they, have, they have to have, like, if you raise a kid in a mm-hmm. particularly, mm-hmm. like, screwed up mm-hmm. learning environment, like, they're going to be a little monster. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. right. um, it's not just, like, a rich exposure mm-hmm. to data. It's actually a pretty controlled yeah. kind of set of data yeah. that you need to expose the kid to so yeah. they learn the right yeah. moral well, sense. And yeah. so, like, can you, I mean, do you have any, I'm not asking you to, like, yeah. tell me, like, what's the data set, but, like... <laughs> What, what kinds of things should you be thinking about in terms of like the richness or sparseness of that data set yeah. and like what kinds of things would it need to have yeah. in it? Yeah. Well, so um, so thought would be um, it's going to involve social learning. Right. Um, and that's going to involve interaction with other systems. And you think of that as interaction between two artificial systems. Well, or with humans. Or with humans. Yeah. In other words, um, uh, to whatever extent possible, uh, these kinds of interactions um, should be part of any system of learning or training. Um, and uh, that's a natural thing. I mean, it's a, we're in a very artificial state right now, in a way. But um, you get a little bit of it, you know, when the large language model puts out all kinds of answers and people will either like or dislike those answers. There's an experiment that was just done at Stanford, but they just have them talking to each other. Yeah. Um, like they, yeah. Yeah, so, right. And um, Self-driving cars are another exper- experiment like this. Uh, you know, uh, I was at a at a talk by, a, a, I guess, the head of research at Microsoft, and he was saying, the other day uh, someone came up to me from uh, our work on autonomous vehicles, and he said, you know, we got this incredibly hard problem to solve. And I asked him what it was, and he said, merging. <laughs> and, um, I w- watched this happen in the mission here. Yeah. Um, two cruise cars just like gave up. They gave up. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. autonomous vehicles are willy nilly acquiring right. some of these kinds of competencies. Um, you know, how to interact in such a way that a, a simple situation like this doesn't become just a, a hopeless failure. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we should be thinking these are agents. Um, uh, the capacities of agents for this kind of understanding is it, it depends very heavily upon their social experience you don't just put kids in a room right yeah like that would be really bad my wife's a mm-hmm. primary school teacher <laughs> they don't just like release the kids and like off they go well right? you know what's you know i i i, I hear what you're saying but a the lot of soci- for- a lot of societies don't do what we do with children right. and they nonetheless the children develop with the quite sensitive capacity to be responsive to morally relevant features. Um, and that's often because, you know, they're left with themselves or they're, uh, um, <clears throat> they're involved constantly in the adult activity. 
I mean, that's an, another kind of case, even from a very early age, they're out there, you know, picking mushrooms or whatever it is. Um, and so I think there are lots of ways uh, which don't particularly involve creating a highly controlled environment, but uh, creating an environment in which there are continual interactions in which there can be mutually beneficial outcomes. Uh, if if uh, they achieve some kind of uh, uh, collaborative solution, um, that I think will be important. And there have to be lots of them, and they have to be varied, and they have to be um, involving different kinds of agents in multiple numbers and small numbers and large numbers. I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's a huge thing, but it's what humans go through. Uh, super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have something, Dan? Or Dan? Okay. Um, Nick's been waiting. Oh, I saw oh, I'm hovering. Nice. You can't see. It. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, yeah. Go yeah. Uh, you can go. Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, please. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess I'm just quick, quick way of putting the question. Can you elaborate on this slide? Sure. Longer way of putting the question. Um, yeah. You could. There's a way of hearing this talk where we get a kind of a genealogical argument for the truth mm -hmm. of virtue, consequentialism, or uh -huh. Rossianism, uh -huh. um, from you know the genealogy of ethical thought to yeah. this. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> right. Is that a way you're conceptualizing this, or? Um, are there other? Yeah, I'll just yeah. leave it there. Yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> interesting the way you, to, to put it that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in, in trying to understand this, uh, so I, I guess you've you've seen some of the uh, sort of kitchen chemistry I've done with students on on moral judgments. Have people seen that at all? Okay. Well, let me. Let me uh, give you some examples. Okay, so um, these are numbers from the most recent time I caught, taught introductory ethics, which is right now. Um, but I'll show you that they're very constant. So uh, here's a standard set of answers to the switch dilemma. Okay, so here's a standard set of answers to the switch dilemma. 87% um, say you should throw the switch. Standard set of answers to the footbridge dilemma. 79% uh, say you shouldn't throw the switch. Uh, what about loop? You know, can we explain the difference between switch and footbridge by saying that it's a principle of something like not using someone as a means to an end? Well, in loop, you are using someone as a means to an end because the trolley is going around like so, and the death of that person is essential for the protection of the other five. But 90% uh, approve that. Um, here's another case. Um, I call this Beckon. Um, and uh, I, I, I devised this case. <laughs> I devised this case because um, I wanted to show that the explanation of footbridge in terms of the uh, fact of laying hands on someone and using actual muscular force to propel the person off the bridge that that isn't a sufficient explanation. So in this case, um, you know the train. Uh, the trolley's coming down the track, the driver slumped over the controls, unconscious. Uh, it's heading down a track where it's going to hit five workers. Um, there's a shed, and next to the shed, there's standing a very large gentleman. And uh, if that large gentleman were to step in front of the trolley by stepping out of the tracks, uh, it would hit him and stop and, and save the five. Uh, you don't have a lever, you don't, can't throw a switch, there's no sidetrack. But you're standing over there on the other side of the tracks, and you could go, hey, this way, to the person, and they would step on the track <laughs> and stop the trolley. Okay, so question, do students think you should do that? Survey says no. No. Uh, just about the same as, as footbridge. Okay, so here's another one. <clears throat> Trains coming down the tracks as before. There are five workers on the track. You're now standing further down the track than the five workers. Um, <clears throat> Next to the five workers, there's a sixth worker standing beside the track. If the train the trolley continues down the track as it does and nothing happens, five workers will be struck and killed. The workers happen to be looking in your direction so they don't see the trolley coming. But if you go like that, um, six workers will step to the side and be saved, but one will step onto the track and be hit. Okay, so should you do that? What do you think? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. You should do that. Uh, this year is high. I mean, it's usually up around ninety percent, ninety-five percent. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Is there a consistent pattern year to year? And so here is here's the pattern over uh, recent times. 
So it's not just an artifact of the way I presented it one year or another, or whether I did the two the same day, or the I do, I vary these things. So a very consistent pattern over the years. Um, and so what's going on? Why would you get these judgments? Okay, now suppose I ask the students, um, you know, I can do this. The, the Institutional Review Board is not there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a pedagogical purpose. You know? um, so if you heard that your roommate, you know, your roommate came home one day extremely upset, what happened? He said, well, I was down by the trolley track and it was coming down the track and it was going to hit these five workers and there was a switch and I could throw it, but it went on the side track and it killed a worker and I feel terrible. Um, if that were the case, would you trust your roommate more, the same or less? And so this is the, a very common outcome of that. What about footbridge? If you came home and you found your roommate saying, you know, ah, the trolley was coming and I didn't know what to do and there was this man next to me, I pushed him off and stopped the trolley. Would you trust your roommate more, the same or less? Okay, quite a different pattern. What about loop? So here's the pattern with loop. What about beckon? Here's the pattern with Beckon. What about wave? Here's the pattern with wave. Okay, so take a look at those all together and what you'll see is that there are <clears throat> two kinds of cases here. Uh, ones in which there is a sum effect on trust, but it's mostly a normally distributed effect. And others where there's a big shift in the direction of mistrust. Okay, so what are the students doing? Well, one possibility is that they're trying to create a mental model of the kind of person who would do this and asking, what about that kind of person? Now, are they getting something wrong? So you probably know the experimental evidence on this. Um, a lot of studies have found that the likelihood of giving a push-like verdict in Footbridge is not correlated with impartial altruism um, or empathy, but with rating on a psychopathy scale, egoism, disregard for ethical transgressions, and lack of perspective taking. Okay? <clears throat> Others have found that the projected model of an agent is lacking in empathy or trustworthiness, seems to mediate responses to the verdicts that they give. Uh, Srapada, my colleague, found a similar mediation in the NOB effect, so-called. Um, okay, so now let me ask another set of questions <laughs> to my students. Uh, suppose that you switch the trolley and switch and you decide that you should visit the family of the single worker who was struck and killed. Which comes closest to your sense of how you would feel in that situation? Regretful and sympathetic with their lost, with a reasonable hope that they'd be understanding, regretful, sympathetic, and guilty with some hope that they'd be understanding, or regretful, sympathetic, and ashamed with little hope they'd be understanding. Okay, and so here's the answer that my students give to that question. Um, what if you did the same thing after the footbridge episode? <laughs> Uh, here's what it would look like. Okay. Now, this is a different set of questions. You know, we're not asking about the trustworthiness of the agent. We're asking how would other people view this? And what kind of relation would you put yourself into with regard to other people if you were to do this? And how would they be very likely to view you? And how would you expect them to view you? And they can give answers to these questions like that. Why are they able to do that? You might say, how would I know what I would feel in those situations? And the answer is, I think that when they're doing moral deliberation about cases like this, they're actually doing quite a complex modeling process that's got this very important social dimension to it, very important characterological dimension to it. And um, suppose we then ask, uh, uh, well, let's see, I'll, I'll try to make a long story short. Suppose we ask about the neuroscience of moral judgment. Okay, so you probably all know that the default network is one of the networks that's most reliably involved in moral judgment. Um, what else does it do? It does autobiographical memory, envisioning the future, theory of mind, and moral judgment. Okay, this suggests that the system that we're using to make these judgments is one that's good at calling up information from memory, uh, projecting that information into the future, Theory of mind tasks, like figuring out what the state of mind would be of other agents in the, in the situation. And so um, my suggestion is, um, <clears throat> what, whatever we think the right moral theory would be, um, this is a better explanation of what's going on in this pattern of moral judgments uh, than is given by any of the standard answers. Um, on the other hand, it's quite compatible with a sort of reasonable version of uh, say, motive consequentialism, 
um, you know, what action would be right? It would be an act that would be performed by someone who had the state of motives or character, which would be most useful for the population to have widely. Well, that would make a tremendous amount of sense also, you know, from the standpoint of these questions about society that I've been discussing. Um, <clears throat> would that also make sense from a sort of Rossian view? where you're imagining the different things that are at stake. Well, there's the you know, the duty to the person to avoid harm. There's the duty to the workers to avoid harm. Uh, there's the relationship that you would be put into with respect to those who were close to this individual. There's the way in which this action would be a, a, a form of unfairness or fairness. And so, um, again, that, you know, this might look like a Rossian <laughs> computation as well. Um, it doesn't look like applying a principle. Um, it looks like running a simulation of a complex kind with all these interesting social and evaluative dimensions. And, and so my, my thought is that uh, the moral theories that are consistent with this, um, for, for whatever else you can say about them, and it's not like saying that they're right, are probably going to do a better job of capturing these aspects of, of moral judgment. And then when we think about those and think about you know, this claim about what's the problem that morality is trying to solve, you think, ah, there's a very nice fit there. So I don't know, you, know, you may not be persuaded by these moral theories, but at any rate, this much can be said on their behalf. That's the thought. Um, and it's, I don't think it picks out you know, Ross versus a, a, an appropriately sophisticated virtue theory versus motive consequentialism. Um, but it suggests that those theories are tracking something about moral sensibility, and the thing that they're tracking is probably something that's of great importance for the evolution of morality as we know it. And it's actually related to infant development, because the infant's got to figure out all the agents around them. <laughs> Who can they depend upon? Who can they not depend upon? Um, how can they uh, manage to, you know, uh, interact uh, in a way that would encourage others to, you know, be their a friend or ally or care about them? And so, um, so I'm thinking, even from a very early age, this thing is going on, and that's why, you know, theory of mind, task, causal reasoning, and so on, are progressing at this, in this shared way. Continued development of this capacity. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm very happy to ask my question. We're also at, at 3.30, so. Um, here Maybe goes. the last question. Cool. Uh, so was I right in hearing a claim, something like you might expect machines to have the functional analogs of emotions? Maybe not like the full qualitative aspect, but uh, because they're like broadly useful tools for a broad class of like cognitive agents and figuring out what to attend to yeah. and what to do. Um, yeah, I was, I, I'm not sure how I f feel about that. I'm kind of doubtful. I mean, I actually haven't really thought that much about what uh, emotions are and why we have them. But it seems like uh, they, a lot of them seem like they're going to be pretty particular to the kind of beings that we are and the machines will not be. Like, they seem very related to, like, homeostasis and, like, protecting your body. They're very, like, evolutionarily ancient. Uh, they're, like, related to, like... Uh, arousal and energy mm -hmm. uh, that seem to be solving like mm -hmm. problems. Yeah, I don't know, for very kind yeah. of chemical mid-sized mm -hmm. creatures. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did not find it intuitive that a, uh, a machine would need to feel like anger. Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, or, or disgust, certainly, right? <laughs> they don't eat. Um, and, and, and in fact, like a lot of the, the more primitive things that the higher emotions would be built on they might not necessarily. So, like, disgust, I think, would probably be a good example, right? Like, moral disgust is maybe kind of built on top of the same systems that yeah. are for poison food or whatever. Uh, and they certainly wouldn't, yeah. or almost certainly they wouldn't have the analog of uh, bodily disgust. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I was curious. Well, well yeah, first a footnote on, on, the, on, on the moral emotions and so on. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a pitch against the, um, the view that... Uh, Something like uh, disgust reactions are what underlie a lot of our moral prohibitions and so on. I think they're actually based much more complicated kind of modeling. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't. I, I don't mean to say that they would have the same emotions we have. Um, but but emotion is a functional solution to a certain problem. So suppose you think of these machines as uh, 
uh, as, as uh, probabilistic learners. And so probabilistic learners have the strength, you know, that they can learn from a tremendous amount of data, but the, dis, uh, the uh, weakness that they don't change quickly. Partly because they're Bayesian, everything's got a weight behind it, and each new bit of evidence is only so much evidence. And so uh, they're, not, uh, they're not adapted to rapid response to changing information. And uh, indeed, you know, they, they, in a sense, would tend to treat a, a sharp change in information more as an outlier than as uh, important news or something like that. And so probabilistic systems of these kinds uh, tend not to be uh, agile with respect to uh, fast emerging evidence of certain types of situations. Um, emotions function like that. Um, what they do is they temporarily actually shift the priors of the individual. The, the situation, you, you know, I'm safe here, right? Then something happens. I'm not safe. Okay, you know, the building starts, to, I don't know what it is. And so suddenly, instead of saying, oh, here's another interesting bit of data, you know, I put that into the heap. It's like, okay, I've got to mobilize a response to this. And it's going to be paying attention to the thing. It's going to be calling up relevant memories. It's going to be shifting the value I place on certain types of actions. It's going to be looking for possible alternatives. Um, and so I've got to do all of that in a big hurry in a coordinated way. And so within the cortex, we don't just have layers upon layers of uh, <clears throat> probabilistic learning cells. We also have a subcortical <laughs> area, which is the affective region. Um, and that's the region that does uh, uh, emotion, but it also does things like spatial navigation, action planning. Um, it's the, the same system that uh, causes us to make uh, spontaneous readjustments of behavior. So um, you can uh, uh, look at, for example, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, amygdala, and it's uh, constantly receiving a stream of information from your bodily organs, but also from the environment, uh, from, uh, from memory, um, from uh, imagined projection and so on. So there's this constant stream of information going to the amygdala, which is doing things like controlling levels of arousal and focus of attention. Um, if you look at the um, Nucleus acubens, you'll see that it is uh, highly sensitive to risk. And if you've got a rat that's in a normal environment, there's only a small slice of it that's uh, paying attention to risk. But if you shift the environment so that it's become risky in a way, a larger portion of that shell becomes sensitive to risk so it can be more finely. And then, and so you can think these are systems of attunement to uh, relevant features of the world for intelligent. Uh, uh, actual living creatures. And you're right, humans have got to be attentive to some things that maybe machines don't because we're bodily located um, and because uh, we have certain types of needs, but they still have to be responsive to risk. They still have to be responsive to certain sudden changes in indicators of risk. They have to be respond to relational questions, be responsive to relational questions, uh, something like trust or distrust or affiliation, uh, allies, um, uh, willingness to, uh, um, you know, a level of arousal, how vigilant, how much of the resources of the system is being devoted to uh, vigilance with regard to the environment, how much is located on the task. Uh, and so a lot of the features of emotion understood in this functional way, which is really, I think, the predominant way, they, they go via the fact that the human mind, the first system with which Perceptual information interacts as the affective system. And the affective system then projects to all these other systems. Uh, but it's primarily concerned with issues like evaluation. It's the same area where evaluation occurs. And so you could say, this is not a bad design. And even if we think that these systems are going to be made out of stacks of, uh, of associative learning, it may be that they will evolve. And I think this is I think some people are saying this is happening. They will evolve subsystems that are more specialized, like to, to certain types of information and, and certain types of relations. And so um, it seems to me that it, one thing that could be emergent is something that functions a lot like emotional capacity.
and what it's going to, what is it going to be concentrated? What I have no idea. But um, because of this kind of uh, uh, special utility of an emotional system for intelligent beings in uncertain environments that need to make responses that are discontinuous adjustments of behavior for certain particular purposes, um, that I would be surprised if we don't find something that functions like that. And once you have something that functions like that, you have a test bed in which you can simulate others in a very efficient way. Because if you can figure out the emotion of the others, then that gives you a tremendous amount of information right away about what you can expect from the individual. And so it's very effective in pr promoting the informed social relations. And one big fact about humans is we're poor at hiding our emotions. We have these highly visible faces, which are extremely expressive. And um, being able to dissimulate about emotions is obviously a strategic advantage, but being more transparent to one another in our emotions is also an important advantage for social relations. And so... Um, are, you, are you saying give the robots faces? Well, um, <laughs> you know, there's some people who think that until you start embodying some of these systems, there are things that they're unlikely to learn well. That could perfectly well be right. You know, uh, they're concerned, for example, with causal learning. <laughs> um, you know, give them some way of interacting with the world. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but the same thing is going to be true with, with, I think, social learning. And I guess these little embodied uh, intelligences have expressive faces. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I'm thinking, yeah, you know, there's this question. How can they be sufficiently visible to each other? Um, you know, could they read each other's code? Well, maybe not, because they would also develop defenses against allowing others to just simply read their code. Uh, but what if they evolved something like emotion, and emotion was something that could be judged um, and could be used in this simulation? Um, we know that systems can get fairly good at reading human, human affect. So, so I'm thinking, yeah, uh, you know, stay tuned. I, I'll be wrong about this, but... <laughs> it is not hard for me to believe that uh, <clears throat> the idea that these systems would not evolve something like empathy, uh, emotional capacities and capacities to project emotion and to mirror emotion, the more complicated their social lives get. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>